was um, for the experience of what to do when these different things happen. Um, and also so that we could prepare our soil. Uh, we'll just tell you right now, Diana and I are the biggest believers that soil is everything. Um, your gardens, productivity, it's um, everything that it does is dependent on how good the soil is. And it takes years and years to get good, really, really good soil. So if you wait until a disaster hits and you have to garden, well, it's going to take you probably several years to get yourself to where you really can get some fruits and vegetables going. Um, until then, you just hope you have good neighbors that will share their fruits and vegetables. Um, yeah, so we're going to talk more about that. But the main, I think one of the biggest reasons that we love to garden is it's so therapeutic to be in the dirt. It is so, and to just, and to um, reap the fruits of your labor. There's just something to that. There's, if you're having, a, if I'm having a bad day, go out and get in the dirt and just get dirty and watch those plants grow and all those different things. So that's probably the biggest, just the love of, of gardening is one of the biggest reasons that we do it. Yeah. Um, what else? Oh, Bruce and I have, okay. She has the experience of being in the same house with the same dirt for 22 years. Yes. Bruce and I have the experience of living in many different places <laughs> and many different starts of, of, of uh, gardens. Um, in the last 16, 17 years being here, we've started in three different places. And the place we are now, we started five years ago um, from scratch, like bad, bad dirt soil. And we're starting over again because we're redoing our, our grow boxes. So one of these days we will be living with 22 year old <laughs> dirt. That would be so fun. Anyway, okay. Um, okay, we're gonna start with, first of all, with placement of the garden. Okay. Is that what we go to next? Yeah, yeah, we can do that. Um, placement of the garden is really, really important. Um, out of sight, out of mind. You know, you really want to have, place your garden somewhere where you can see it every day, where you are going to be, you know, it's going to be on your mind and things like that. If you kind of have it tucked away, a lot of times you might just get to the point where, uh, I can't see it, don't worry about it. But you never want to be like that. Um, if, so if you put it in a place where you can see it daily, um, it's just, you know, be, you'll be that much more aware of it. So that's a really good thing about it. Um, the other thing is, is you want to place your garden where your water source is. You know, there's nothing worse than have to either have your hose strung clear across your lot. We have big lots up here, so it'd be a long hose. Or, you know, having to lug buckets. Uh, we are, we are high desert. We, as everyone knows, we don't get near the rain we would like to have. And uh, water is really, really important. So make sure that your water source is close by. So that whatever method you decide to use for irrigation, you know, you've got it right there. Uh, so. And then the hours of sunshine. Oh, okay. Thank you. I forgot to turn my feet over. Oh, <laughs> okay. <laughs> yeah, look at our notes. So um, the other thing is um, most plants need between six and eight hours of sunshine. So you, you wouldn't want to place it underneath um, shady places where your trees are. Uh, especially tomatoes. Tomatoes, they really like to have eight hours of sun. And something that can kind of help you um, put into perspective uh, how much sun your plants need is the bigger the fruit, the more sun it needs. So kind of um, use that to kind of help gauge it. If you have a place where you're like, well, I don't get quite as much sun as I'd want to, but I really want to grow tomatoes. Well, then you might want to consider growing what's called a patio tomato. Um, the fruit doesn't get quite as big as some of your beef masters and some of those, and you can be successful in things like that. So uh, just kind of know where you are planting and then be aware of what your needs are in that area. Um, but, but most of all, remember that you do need between six and eight hours of sun a day. Yes, I have a question. Can you get too much sun? So we live in a really bright, sunny environment here. Mm -hmm. um, it seems like sometimes it just dries the plants out, kills them, whatever, okay. if it's too much sun. 
Well, okay, and there's, there's different factors that have to go with that. Um, plants can take full sun. They can take it all day long. The biggest factor is, is how is your soil? If your soil is amended and it's really nice and loamy and it can hold in the moisture, then your plants can stay out in that sun and it's not gonna be as a big a deal to them. But if you are um, just starting out, your soil's maybe not amended as much as you would like it to be, and it doesn't really hold that water, then you are gonna find that your plants are, you know, when it gets to be four o'clock in the afternoon, they're gonna just start really, you know, wilting. They will come back up once the, you know, the sun goes down. But, you know, those are, those are things you can do to help them. I also know that um, uh, the Smiths in Winchester, they have yeah. felt like oh, yeah. what they needed to make their garden best is they use some of those um, shade cloths and they got them kind of in the shape of a, of a shade of those cells, you know, the, the triangles. And so they have um, strategically placed those around in their garden area to give some of their plants that might be, um, you know, not as tolerant to the heat, give them a little bit more moisture. Um, something that I will point out is Winchester has a lot more sand than we do. Mm -hmm. And so therefore they have to amend their soil a way more than we, than we do here. We have a lot more clay here in most areas. There are some sandy places. I happen to live um, on, a, on a sandbar. It's the funniest thing, but my lot is a sandbar. And so whenever it rains, we do pretty good. We don't sink too much. But I tell you, I cross over into my neighbor's yard and I will sink this much into the, you know, in, after it rains in the mud. So um, that's also is, is be aware of what type of soil that you have here and then amend your soil appropriately. But those are some of the things as far as sun goes. If your soil's good, then it can take a whole lot more sun. Does it make more sense if you're doing row boxes? Yeah, uh, well, that's how we do it. It, it. That's the way we have decided is the best for us. You had a thing about the pro for uh, rain. Yeah. Why? Because you don't want to bend over. <laughs> Um, you don't want them to be super high because that means that they just they just lose their water quicker. If they're lower to the ground, they don't you don't have to water as much. Okay. So that's one thing I know. And then what was the other pros on your thing? Um, well, some of the pros for okay. Well, we'll just kind of start off. Um, I I started with um, just gardening in the in the ground, mm -hmm. and I like that because it did give a versatility as far as you know the size that I wanted to garden in and um, different things like that. Uh, where you have a grow box, you know, you pretty much grow, you just, you know, the size and shape of that. Mm -hmm. But I did choose to go ahead and do grow boxes. Uh, one of the things that um, pros for a grow box is because my grow boxes are about, oh, about this tall. And um, because of that, the soil actually warms quicker. You know, it's sitting up above the ground, it gets warm quicker, so therefore my seeds germinate quicker. And then also um, when you have a grow box, you a lot of times have more control over the quality of soil that you have in your grow box because it pretty much stays right there. It doesn't run off, you know, if you forget to turn the water off or something like that. But um, so those are some of the, the pros. So you want to them low, then you want to keep them low. Side. That's the so highest you'd want to go. Yeah, eight inches is great. Yeah. Put, it, put them on lights so that if you had the eight inches of dirt that you're talking about, that maybe a three foot um, you know what we haven't gardened like that there is I know that there's systems out there like that because um, for people who are um, handicapped in some way um, I know that they've they've done that so that they can just you know everything's right here at waist level um, I don't have so, any experience but it basically would it. be a box then on legs is what so, you're saying yeah. yeah your limitation to a box on legs is there's no root there yeah so don't do that yeah Secondly, I have a grow block that's four foot high, but it's made out of concrete block mm -hmm. and it faces south. So I'm growing things you cannot grow in Diamond Valley in that grow box because it stays warmer Longer. than everything else. Yeah. So I'm growing uh, sweet potatoes in that grow box and getting 200 pounds out of <laughs> a 30 foot long grow box. Amazing. Wow. Amazing. Wow. And when do you plant your sweet potatoes? As soon as it's warm enough not to freeze them at yeah. the top. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Very good. Yeah. 
Yeah. This year is, yeah. See, that's great. I, I love hearing that. Yeah, yeah, that's that's fun. So four foot high. Because I do sweet potatoes almost every year. And anyway, but and and I have had luck with them. And I'm I just today started my sweet potato slips, starting those, because I usually start them sooner, but I just am now getting but we'll get to that in a minute. Um, anyway, okay, so any more questions about uh, garden placement or any ideas that you guys have that would work good? I love it. Yes, Kevin. As opposed to, to um, grow boxes, have you ever had any experience with post holding? Where you get a post hole digger and you dig two or three feet down to fill it with amended soil and just have a series of post holes versus. I've done it. Yeah, we've done it. Successful here. Yeah. Oh, last year. Melons. Yeah. <laughs> last year we had every day we had a sweet melon of some sort. They were growing crazy last year. So yeah, we've done that. Because it's pretty hard to, to dig up this clay. Mm -hmm. I mean, yeah. If you don't have a mechanical advantage, the clay is really hard to. Oh yeah. And so making a big grow box or a big, big garden without big tiller. You know, it depends on what you want to grow. But for our melons, that worked really, really good. Well, and you know, and I can see the advantages of doing something like that in that you have a, a smaller place that you're amending the soil. Mm -hmm. And then as time goes by, you can, you know, increase that size. Mm -hmm. But, you know, in the beginning, you know, that's a great alternative. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Okay. We're going to go to the most important part of your garden, and that is your soil. Um, so I brought this from my, my yard. And the yard that we have now, uh, when we bought it, there literally wasn't even weeds growing or ever growing. And I think what they did was they sterilized the soil because, so that's how we started this garden. And so anyway, this is the soil that has not been amended. It's just, you know, it's crusty on top. It's not got a whole lot of co good color to it. Um, this is the soil that we're in our grow boxes right now, which we have added all kinds of things to. And you can tell it just looks nice and yummy that'll grow something and this is what's coming out of my compost pile right now um so i just add this to to this and this and all kinds of whatever i mean it just all kinds of stuff so that's what's coming out of the compost pile that we are going to talk about in a few minutes about composting um well, can i share my story oh that's right oh yes we've got to have <laughs> this is story. a funny story <laughs> so okay it was it one the first second year that i moved up here and i designed my garden spot my garden spot was where i could see it from my back porch and so what i did was is this um i mapped it out it's this perfect square and i put grape vines so i would know where my borders were and david made me this cute little you know arch and everything it was so cute my grapes were doing great and so I proceeded to plant, and I was so proud of this little garden. Well, there was um, a master gardener who was up in Veo, and he was doing a gardening class. And anyway, I asked him, I says, will you come look at my garden? Because I was kind of proud of it. <laughs> and um, so I get over there, and, and of course, nothing was really growing, because it kind of was early spring. But if you looked at my soil, my soil was this color, you know, just this old dead brown color. And, uh, but anyway, and he looks at my soil and he takes a shovel and he kind of just does a little shovel and he says, your soil's dead. <laughs> like, my soil's dead? What does that mean? I, I was clueless, I didn't know. But what he was trying to tell me is, is you are not gonna grow very, you, you will not be successful having soil look like this. And my soil looks just like this. I didn't know about amending soil. I didn't know about adding organics and, and things like that. I just thought, oh, it's dirt. So you plant seeds in it and your stuff will grow. And um, anyway, he taught me differently. And so um, anyway, dead soil, living soil. <laughs> and it makes it, it makes it huge. It does. And, and I guess one of the things that helped me understand was is he, he did say, he says, you have no worms. If you don't have any worms, it's a good indication you have dead soil. Yeah. Because even if you don't put worms in there, if you've got good soil, the worms just come. And in my compost pile, when I dig in there, Bruce keeps stealing my worms because he likes to go fishing. But <laughs> there's a lot of worms in my compost pile. There's a lot. And, 
and let's talk about composting for just a minute because I, I'm, there's a kind of a formula they like you to use. Brown, you, you have your browns and your greens and you have more brown than green. And there's kind of a formula. I think it's like four to one or something. Four browns to one part green. And I try, we, we've tried composting several times and using those, I don't know, we're just not exact gardeners. So our compost pile is us just throwing stuff in. Once in a while we turn it, we think about sprinkling it every now and again. And it probably takes longer to make it into compost, but it makes compost. I mean, this is really what is coming out of there now. And so we'll add the chicken, um, when I clean out my chicken coop, when we'll add, and I put um, wood shavings in my chicken coop, so I add all of that in there. I, I think when you add your garden, I put most of my um, um, leftovers from, from our food, like our lettuce or whatever, I usually give them to my chickens because they love it. But every now and again, I put some in my compost. And I think that's what really the worms love. They go to that food. And so I'll just put a little bit of that in there. And then the grass clippings and manure. Tell them what brown is and what green is. Oh, yes. Okay, so brown. Okay, I've got that right here. Brown are, is your dry leaves. Um, straw is considered brown, but alfalfa is considered green. Wood chips, um, sawdust, newspaper. Um, I mainly use dry leaves and my wood chips is mainly what my brown is. So sometimes of the year you have more brown than green. And sometimes the years you have more green than brown because you know, fall, winter, whatever. And so whatever it is, I just throw it in and eventually it makes compost. Uh, green would be your food scraps, manure, and grass clippings. So those are your kind of, that's what, you, what your green is and then the brown. So you just kind of have to mix it together. Um, we get a lot of manure here because our friends have horses. And, and we share. We they share, share manure. You just call me up. We'll share. Yep, they bring it over and dump it even. <laughs> yes. Okay, weeds. Will the compost Kill the I don't put weeds in my compost because if you're if you're a really good composter and you can get it hot enough, which you know, then you have to be a little more exact with everything, then yes, it should, but I just don't. So I don't put weeds in. In grow box too, you could really easily maintain your weeds Easier, easier, yeah. yeah. Yes. Uh, a turning bucket, a box, a whole host of other compost things. Give me an opinion on those. We've tried the turning ones. Nah, mm -mm. No, they, they don't work as like for us. Bruce, he hated it. <laughs> I had, but I got theirs. I hated it. <laughs> like, I like this hair. But um, no, it's, it's not big enough. The, the bigger the area that you have, it usually, it usually should be about a, a four by four is the smallest that you would want to have a, co a composting site be. So if four by four cube, if you can just kind of visualize that, um, then that's where you're gonna be most successful because you do have to generate that heat from the inside of that compost pile. And that's what helps everything break down, you know, those organisms and stuff like that. I will tell you, um, w one time, bless David's heart. <laughs> <laughs> He, I came up with this really great idea so that I could have a four by four. So I know what it was. He dug me a four by four hole. And <laughs> a man loves me, okay? <laughs> so I start throwing in all my stuff in there. I throw my manure in there. I throw in my, you know, my straw, all this different stuff. And I got it right there. But after a while, it really started stinking. I mean, it didn't stink healthy way. It stunk unhealthy way. Um, you do have to get air to your pile. So, and that was the problem is, is the air wasn't getting in there and circulating the way it needs to. I was watering it, I was turning it, but it has to have air. So don't have anybody dig you a hole and think you can compost. You will not be successful. So speaking of a hole real quick, yeah. I get tired of turning compost piles and all I do is dig a very shallow trench, eight inches, mm -hmm. and I compost in the trench next to my garden. It's next year's garden. Perfect. I just got tired of moving compost. Yeah, it is. A trench That's a good idea. Such an easy solution on that one. Oh, good. What about the compost from the dump? Oh, I got another story. She has a story. Okay. See, I got all these stories. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad I can share them with you guys so you don't have to go it's through all the stuff some I did. It's good for some things, but. Um, this has probably been, it's been about 10 or 12 years ago. Um, I did go and got a massive, again, David, bless his heart. David, will you please go get me compost? Yes, he did. 
And so he, he brought it and I put it in my garden and then I couldn't grow anything. Um, and what it was is the solidity level was way too high. It was, it was way too high. It was um, from the fairgrounds, right? From the fairgrounds. Fairground. And what it is, is they were using the water that was coming out of the Virgin River, which also has a very high salt level. And that with the horse, horse manure, you know, with all the electrolytes and everything that, you know, gets excreted, um, that it was just so high. So um, I did something that we're going to talk about in a minute. And that's is I went and had my soil tested. Um, well, let's just talk about that. Yo, go ahead. Anyway, I had it tested. When it came back, it was off the charts. Mm -hmm. They're just like, you will not grow anything in here. And I'm like, you're right. I can't grow anything in here. Um, and so I had to do a lot of, I had to amend my soil. I had to do a lot of leaching and try to get those salts um, from up here and, and get them down low enough so that the roots weren't, they weren't bothering the roots anymore. So um, be very careful where you get it. Um, the compost out there is great if you just want to put it around, you know, in your yard, mm -hmm. but don't use it for garden. Yeah. So good questions. Um, so testing, um, that's a great way. You can do it um, yourself you can, as far as what type of soil you have. Um, there is a link in our, our thing that takes you to a really simple YouTube of, you just get a, a couple, a, I don't know, a cup or two of dirt and then you fill it with water and then there's a little, you shake it up and then you let it sit for one minute and then you put a line to see where the, because I think the sand, is it the sand that goes first? I can't remember. Anyway, and then an hour later you make a line and then an hour, uh, 24 hours later you make another line and then you do this percentage thing. Anyway, the YouTube explains it really, really good. So if you want to do that yourself, you can. Or there's also a link to the extension office, which sends you to a link where you can actually download the form and it tells you exactly how you, what you can do to uh, have your soil tested. You send it off to Utah State and they come back a week or two later. Oh, really quick. Yeah. And it's only like, how much was it? Oh, $15. Yeah, $15. $15 get it. Something like that. And you might want to test several spots in your, in your garden. Um, area and just see what your what is your soil made up of? Is it made up of clay, sand, or silt? Well, you know, it'd be a huge advantage if, if you know, you're at that place right now where you're just not quite sure what way to go with your garden, what you're working with, and things like that. Do that right now. Do it right now. You can, um, a lot of times, if you do it on a Monday, you'll have the results back on Thursday or Friday. Um, you, you just, you send it up to them, they immediately do all the testing, and then they'll just email you the report. It's very, very quick. And then you know what you're dealing with. Then you'll know, you know, you need to add this. And, and they'll tell you, they'll walk you through it. They give you a really great description. Mm -hmm. So um, what you'll need it's, it's cheap, it's easy, and you'll know just exactly what you're dealing with. Yes, so that is a great idea. Because um, your, your soil is gonna be made up of silt, uh, sand and clay. Now, normally here we're more clayish, but like she's on a sandbar. Some of our spots in our, well, when we lived at Lone Coyote, it was good and sandy. We, ha oh, we had great gardens there. Ours is more clay where we are now. And the answer to anything is? Add organics. Add organics. Always. That is just, you just, if you can just, the more organic, yes, Bruce. Well, I, I went out and got Tons of sand put in my yard, so yeah, we did. I, was, I mean, when, when you have that much clay, you need to have sand. Yeah, and we I, did, and that's when we were, we dug into the ground, and then we added sand, and we added um, the chunks of what was that volcanic chunk? You know, because. Yeah. Well, we just got the crushed volcanic rocks because it adds minerals to your soil. Um, what else do we put in there? I don't remember. Anyway, those kinds of things, anything that you can add, but yeah. So for, for us, I mean, for any of it, it's just, you got to just keep adding your organics, which is your compost and all that sort of thing. Yes. So would you not add chicken manure straight to the garden? You would put it in a compost first? I would. Um, if you wanted to add it during the winter and let it sit, and then maybe turn it a little bit here and there. I, I don't know why that wouldn't work. How do you, so wh when you do your eight inch trench. Anything goes in it. Just Mostly kitchen scraps and that kind of stuff. And we've got chickens too. So a lot of our stuff goes to the chickens. Yeah. Mm -hmm. 
Oh, I just you, put in um, never add any animal byproducts to yes. your compost pile. Yeah. So um, never any grease. meat scraps or grease or anything like that. You just want to keep it um, free of that. Otherwise, um, a couple things will happen. One is it'll stink, stink and smell and it, and it won't break down the way it needs to. And then you'll also have animals always getting into it. Okay. Any questions? Let's see, is there anything on our list that we haven't done? Oh, okay, so there's, there's a guy that I kind of follow. His name's Caleb Warnock, and he lives up in Alpine area somewhere. And I, I didn't bring the book, but he does a no-tilling method. So he basically gets his soil how he wants it, and then he doesn't touch it. He just puts compost on the top, plants in that, and then starts, then that, and that's how he um, does his garden. And he has a little book on it, a tilling, no tilling method. And also what happens is you get those worms going, mm -hmm. if you get enough worms, that basically is your tilling because they go come up and go down and they aerate and the whole thing. So, so like I said, different ways of adding the organics and the, the also the um, worms, what is it called? What do they call that? Per perma permaculture what is that anyway worms add to your to your uh, soils as well oh. just it's it's really 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 good yeah um any questions on soil that's the biggest thing yes Kevin. in the clay valley do we even have worms in the area or do we have to bring them in no <laughs> <laughs> you can bring them in if you want to but we have you worms You'll get worms. You'll get worms. And the thing is, is so you're like, oh, my garden doesn't have any worms. Let me go. I've done this. Let me go get some worms. David, can I have the rest of your worms from fishing? I put them in my soil and then I never see worms again. My soil was not able to sustain the worms. Yeah. You have to have the organics. You have to go in and, um, you know, mm -hmm. add that into your soil and mend it so that your worms can live there. Just because you bring them, they're not going to live. Do you add lime or anything like that when you have acidic soil? To we don't have acidic soil. We, we have alkaline. We are alkaline. You. So, okay, so that would be your own. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and again, if you're wondering what to add to your soils, go and get that test done at the mm -hmm. Utah State. It's, um, you, you will be amazed how much information it'll give you, and you'll feel so much um, more confident in your gardening if you know what it is you're dealing with. Well, and our, our acidic story is that <laughs> Bruce wanted to grow blueberries mm -hmm. and it has to have acidic soil. So we did everything we could to make our soil acidic. Like we added, what did we add, Bruce? Acid. Acid. <laughs> but what was the kind of acid we added? It was a certain kind. Anyway, we did everything we could to make acidic soil. It just didn't work. <laughs> so there's just some things that don't work. But you try. Yeah. It's fun trying. It's fun trying. Yeah. Um, oh, what I was going to say about clay, and this is from Caleb Warnock. This is, was his thought on it because he has clay soil up there. When you do the raised beds, you have a really great soil level and then underneath is the clay. But what happens is, is the clay does hold the moisture. And so if you can get your plants to grow and then your, your roots get down into that clay, the moisture is down there. And so it's actually can be a good thing as long as you've got the good stuff on top. Yeah. So, so clay can be good. Okay, where do we go now? Watering system. Watering systems. Okay, Bruce is going to be our expert watering system person because he's the one that does this. I, I can never understand. I still have to ask him which button do I push. <laughs> so what's the next? I, I, you know, we just there's try different things. Um, yeah, there's there's. Uh, there's a lady in uh, Laverkin that has that organic. Uh -huh. Allie's uh, Organics. Oh, yeah. She just puts a sprinkler and just sprinkles everything, you know, and, and it works great for her. And, and there's different ways of doing that. Uh, what we have found over the years is this stuff, uh, this uh, black plastic pipe is indestructible. Uh, in our property, we, I have three different zones and it's all automated, it's on a drip system. So I, I do all my fruit trees with one, goes all around my property. And, and so you have a, a black pipe here and then you can put these little uh, emitters, you know, and there's different kinds of emitters. There's all different kinds of them. I like these because they have a little stake and you can put them in the ground, they stay there. 
And uh, you can also adjust the tops on them. So some of them I might want to have just a little bit of water coming out, others a lot more. Some of them you want to just turn off. And then they have different kinds of them. Um, got a couple in my pocket. There, there's some that uh, will have a, a like a, a mist coming out, spray all different, you know, the, it'll cover everything. And then there's some that just spring out, uh, spray out just little streams of water. But uh, I use uh, the kind that spray out everywhere when I'm when I'm uh, starting seed because it gets everything like all our uh, radishes and and things that we plant uh, carrots especially where we have seeds everywhere. Uh, we like that. Um, these are easy to use. They don't freeze during the winter. If it gets really cold, they'll never break. I've never had one break. Have we? Uh, they're very reliable. They when I put a shovel in one. The, the one negative thing about these is uh, they'll get clogged with dirt and you have to go and open them up every now and then. And, and so what I do try to alleviate that is, is this is how I uh, uh, do the ends. Actually, how do I do that? Like this, and then that, uh, and you can use all different kinds of things. You can just wrap it with tape just to hold it and that stops it. But, uh, uh, in the spring, when I start my garden, I'll, I'll turn the water on and just let water flow out of here and it'll be brown, get all the dirt out, clear it up. And, and that makes it so you don't have as much problem, these things clogging up on you. Um, I also like to use uh, these little valves here. I'll put these in our garden. Um, uh, we have uh, two different garden zones, one for our south side of the house and one for the uh, west side and and in those zones I have multiple different spots where I'm watering and they're all on an automated drip system and so I, I also put these little things out here so I can regulate how much water is going through and if I want to turn one zone off and leave another one on I can do that with this um, so sometimes it gets kind of complicated. Deanna can't remember what's what. Remember. You know, <laughs> we got three zones, and so you know we, we <laughs> you put it on a timer. It's helpless. Does anybody uh, know why you want to do a timer? I forget every other day otherwise. Yeah. I'll kill it in a week. I mean, and then you go on vacation. You don't have to worry about your garden. You, just, <laughs> you know, you know it's gonna water when you're gone. Yeah, so, but we have we have flooded our areas too when we've forgotten. I um, guess this is a pressure regulator. No, this is a timer. This is a timer, a timer that I use at my house, and it's kind of cool because it can go up to ninety minutes, and it's just it's really easy. It's just real manual. You just set it for the amount of time. Operated? No, it's spring operated, and so um, it'll go and it works every time. Just shuts it off. And the cool thing about it, it's twelve dollars if you you know Amazon Prime. Yeah, you can buy uh, battery operated ones, you know, in the last couple of years almost. Yeah. Um, we have uh, the regular, you know, Orbit yeah. and uh, Rainbird on the wall that we use and it works fine. Uh, any questions? Well, there's a million different ways to water your garden. I mean, how do you know how much to water different? We always love to water. We just love to water things, don't we? Yeah, we, I, we keep saying I, we're not going to water so much this year, but for whatever reason, I over -water it's just fun to water. Every year. Uh, <laughs> I don't know how to water. <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, you know, during when it gets real hot, I'll water every day. Um, probably every other day or every three days up till when it starts getting over 100 degrees out. So I, 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 I'm not an expert at it. I don't know. I, you know, some plants take more water than others. I mean, and they're all on the same drip system. So it's, it's you know, some things are going to do better than others. But I, I do know that plants like to have uh, a regular watering system. Like tomatoes, you don't want to overwater them and irregular watering because they don't react to that. You'll get that uh, that rot. Dry rot on the that? bottom. Yeah. Bottom rot. Yeah. Bottom rot. But uh, I love this stuff. It's indestructible. We've had uh, we've had all kinds of stuff. We've had we've this used. in our house. We've had now for five years, and I don't have any issue. 
Yeah, starting nursery, uh, you can get like 50 foot for 10 bucks, you know. Um, you have the little. Yeah. So what we do is, let, we'll just show you. you. We have this stuff, and then we put this on. Well, this is a little bit different. But we'll put one, something like this with the emitter on the, oh, like this. Yeah. And then going. you just can put it, and it's gone as, about that long, and then we can just place it kind of different spots. And right now, we have them about how, every, how far are we? Every like, two, three feet. Um, so we we have some grow boxes, and I just spent a ton of time building some new ones this year out of rock. They look good. I hope like they work the good. We're but hoping they grow something this year. I'll bury one of these all along the you know uh, grow box, and then I'll have these lines coming out and going in, and and so it's real easy to to pull these up and stick them away, and then you can rake and plant, and then put them back in and. Uh, it makes it so much easier. And like if you're going towards a tomato, maybe you would use a different emitter, right? Don't we use different emitter, or do we use these? Uh, you can use different ones, but. Uh, yeah. So it depends on what the plant is going towards as to how much you have this up or down. So, yeah. Just a note on uh, sprinkling. Tomatoes, if you spray them, you're giving an opportunity for the hornworm moths mm -hmm. to yeah, they don't like so water don't on their leaves. Yeah, we don't spray them. We just spray Everything else is uh, mm -hmm. pretty much okay with yeah. spray. Yeah. Yeah. And you can't, I mean, this Caleb Warnock that has massive amounts of gardens, he's on an oscillating thing that just, that's how he waters his garden. But he, he's also up north, he's though. All, and no, so it works for different. them up there because, you know, they have higher humidity things. We're just so dry. It is something you have to really be careful of. Yeah. My grow boxes are about 40 feet long. And, and so, you know, as I'm planting, I can open these up and shut them off, you know, so I'm only watering part of it and it makes it a whole lot easier. And then I have one of these valves on each grow box. So yeah. anyway. Any thought, any ideas that you've used for watering that we can be helped with? Because <laughs> we've tried all kinds. Well, I'll just say it's really great to have a system mm -hmm. um, because if you have something that's set up, you don't have to babysit it. You know, when I've got everything set up, um, I, I set my garden up according to what I've got planted. Um, I'll use something like this that has these little emitters every 80 inches. Um, and it's kind of more of a sulfur effect. And I'll use that on like, my lettuce, on um, radishes, on my beets, things like that. Um, that kind of take more of a soaking kind of a thing. Um, these, you know, pumpkins, things like that, they like all of that. But um, once you've got it all set up, then you know, okay, it's, it's the third day or it's the second day, however it is you choose to water your garden according to your soil. However good your soil is depends on how often you water. If you've got really good amended soil, you can get away with um, watering like every third day. Um, if you're still amending your soil and, and getting it up to where it needs to be, you probably will be watering more often. But the point is, is you can go out and you can turn on your timer and then you can walk away. And I can't tell you how many times poor Marlene Kazir has called me up and says, Jolene, your water's overflowing. <laughs> and it was because I didn't have a timer. It's because I didn't have um, a real watering system set up. I was just taking the hose out and I was watering down a row. And, you know, time got away from me and, um, Anyway, and I had a huge mess, and it affected my neighbors. <laughs> Kevin? Growing up, we had irrigation water pipes in the way it was called beaver water. Yeah. And uh, all our gardens were just trash irrigated. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't suppose that would work here just because of the expense of the water, but it, it worked really good there. Yeah, you know? yeah. We just don't have, when we were buying a house here, I was looking for some place that had irrigation and the only place that was, was downtown St. George. They had irrigation water, but we couldn't find anywhere else that did. So anyway, okay. So Anything, um, it's, we're already 45 minutes. Yeah. <laughs> and we're okay. not done. Okay. Um, next. Let's see. Um, I, I guess oh, we'll go back to that in a minute. Okay. Oh, let's go back to the, let's go. We'll stay on our, thing. okay. Okay, Diamond Valley and when to plant things. The biggest thing here, the, the weirdest probably thing that we have here is our temperature fluctuation. We go from really cold at night, even in the summer, here, uh, my kids up at North, they would be warmer at night than we are here in Diamond Valley. 
and yet we will get hotter than them up there. So we have this fluctuation of like 50 degrees sometimes. And that is hard on plants. And it's hard to know when to plant because you have this huge temperature change. Um, well, the other thing is, is elevation. Okay, so we are only, what, 13 minutes from St. George. But we are not the same as St. George. So St. George is what they are, 2,700 in elevation. And we are 4,750. That is a big difference. Uh, you cannot put your things in the ground the same time St. George does. Um, we will freeze every single time. We're actually about two to two and a half weeks, depending on the spring, behind St. George. You know, from when their trees flower, from when their soil gets to, you know, certain temperatures and things like that. We are just behind. And that kind of that kind of makes it hard on us. We're actually a lot closer. If we could think of ourselves a little bit closer to Cedar City and maybe use that as our guide, then I think um, I find that I'm a lot more successful that way. Um, part some of the problems, there is some problems with that, and we'll kind of go over that in a minute. But just, our average um, frost-free date is May 15th, right? Mm -hmm. But I still don't like to plant tomatoes. If I'm doing tomatoes outdoors without a wall of water, I'm waiting till June to plant, plant them. If you, if you, and like, but if you in a, in a safe spot or whatever, like we, we did plant tomatoes, but they're in walls of water and they survived the snowstorm. So there you go. So walls of water are great if you want to start early, but. Describe the walls of water. Okay, Bruce, show us, I, I forgot my wall of water. <laughs> show us this picture. Come here. So it's, bring it over here so he can see it. And show, you need to show the Zoom people. I'll show the Zoom people right here. And we do have links to that. I don't know if I put oh, links to the wall. <laughs> okay, I forgot the wall of water. A little closer. So the, the concept of it is, is you're surrounding the plant um, with this plastic tubing filled with water and it helps to um, buffer the elements is what it does and stuff. It kind of helps keep, up. what's that? The water keeps up. And it yeah, keeps it does. Yeah. It does. And so, um, and it, so you just, so what we do for our tomatoes, we put our tomato um, holder, what is that, Ages. tomato cage down, and then we put the wa walls of water around it, because they do blow over. You have to either stake them or whatever, but we've just found that if you put the cage in on, and then the, the, um, the wall of water, and like I said, we went through that snowstorm recently, and they're still alive and going. Now, where do you get the wall? Um, I've gotten at IFA and Walmart, Amazon. Amazon, Amazon, everything. It's easy Amazon. to find. It's it's really well known. Okay. Yeah, it's really well known. Um, I guess going back to what I was talking about, if you if we think of ourselves a little bit closer to Cedar City, as um, far as um, our planting schedule, okay. um, we will be more successful in not having things freeze. The problem with that is, is by that time, the nurseries down in St. George, they're pretty much. Um, they're finished with all of their stuff. You know, it's already been picked through. Their stuff's already pretty much root bound, things like that. I've had a lot of success. Well, I, I plant most of mine, I go by seed. I like seed. And so I, I'll start all my own stuff. But if you don't want to do that, um, head up north, you know, go up to Cedar City, Cedar City Beaver. Beaver has a wonderful nursery. Um, a lot of times I'll just, I'll head up there because they won't have anything left in town except for jalapeno peppers, <laughs> you know, and, um, and those are great, but you don't want a whole garden full of those. So um, anyway, just some options you can kind of think of that way if you choose to start from plants rather than start from seed. The other thing in the valley is there's cold pockets, like where I am, it's way colder than on the other, on this side of Diamond Valley, because um, you'll get apricots on this side of diamond and I rarely get apricots even yeah. though, and I told Bruce not to plant apricot trees at this place mm -hmm. we have two apricot trees because he just can't he has to um and I think we did though that one year a couple years ago when we had that bumper crop of everything we did get some apricots but yeah. that's about the only time we've ever gotten them so there is cold pockets know where you're living at, you know so wait till that um till to time to plant it's just you have to be patient yeah. Bruce is not patient. We've already planted broccoli and cabbage twice because Bruce loves to plant. And he can't, if it's a sunny day, he's planting. <laughs> well, and I guess <laughs> one of these days we will learn. But, okay, and then, um, and I don't know who, you know, understands 
I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm just assuming everybody understands, but in case everybody doesn't, um, there's different crops. Oh, you yeah. got your cool weather crops and you have your warm weather crops. And so um, they have to go into the ground at, at different times. Mm -hmm. So cool weather crops, just for, just to say, um, carrots, peas, beets, cabbage, you know, things like that. They can broccoli. have broccoli. They can have um, cooler weather. Your tomatoes, you could no way put your tomatoes in the ground the same time as you do your peas and your beets and beans and things like that. Yes. Yes, they will. I've already got, yeah, spinach, yeah, lettuce. Chard is hardy. Yeah. Are you going to talk about seeds? Yeah. Where you get them? Oh, yeah, we've got a really good, yeah, yeah. So um, so just understand that you do have warm weather crops, cool weather crops. If you do it right, you can have two different gardens in the same year. Mm -hmm. And that's what I usually try to do. So, like, anyway. for instance, carrots, I like to plant. I can't remember if I do it in the end of July, sometime in there. And then they get good by the time... November, December comes on, they can stay in the ground all winter and you can pick them all winter. So I love doing that with carrots. Yeah. So understand your seed, <clears throat> understand your plants, what you're working with. Um, see, so let's get down to, are we ready? Okay, go ahead. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, let's go back to a little bit about planning out your garden. Um, it's you will be most effective if you actually plan out your garden. Um, this is for different purposes because there, one is there's different ways to garden. We talked about you know the the way that we grew up with everyone doing it in the rows, and and that's great. And a lot of people are very successful with that. Um, one of my favorite ways is um, square foot. Maybe you've heard about square foot gardening. I love this. Um, you can grow vertically. You can um, you can um, get a lot more plants in a smaller area if you follow the way that, that they say to do it. Um, I actually do kind of a hybrid. I do a little bit of both. I do a little bit of traditional and I do a little bit of the square foot gardening. Um, I love growing vertically. Um, you'll, you'll see like all of my cucumbers and my squash and things like that. They're all up trellises and things like that. I like getting them off the ground. It, it makes me feel like maybe I'm getting one over on the squash bugs. <sighs> because they're squash off the bugs. ground. We have no answers for squash bugs. <laughs> we have none. <laughs> Just a little bit of trivia. Squash bugs live for three years. Three years and stuff. So um, anyway, you want to get on top of those. Yeah. yeah. Sure. In the winter months, they just burrow down in the ground and then come spring, they just pop right back up. So we have not found anything that works with squash bugs other than seven yeah. dust. And I know so if you don't want to put poisons in your thing, uh, yes. Do you have an answer squash to Squash bugs. Two solutions. I've used both of them. I like the automated one better. Huh? Automated. Automated. So the first one that works is a shop vac. Oh, she's done that. Do that. that every day. Yes, you have to the do it every day. The automated one makes a lot of noise, but it works. It's called a guinea fowl. It's the only bird that will eat squash bugs, and we had them last year, and they ate every last squash bug. No challenge. I'm getting one. Now, what is it? A guinea, guinea fowl. Fowls. Guinea. Just a, the bird? Yeah. Oh, oh, okay. I was thinking of some kind of mechanical thing. I'm like, oh. It's automated. And they don't eat your... your. They don't scratch like chickens do, and they don't eat the vegetables like chickens do. They just eat the bugs. Because they're a high meat bird, they eat protein. I'm amazed. See what you can learn from other people? And, and this is scream. amazing. <laughs> and they <laughs> scream? So don't get too many of them. We, we got four times too many because that was the minimum buy. If you're going to buy guineas, go in with somebody else. It's a 15 bird minimum buy. Yeah. And we only needed four or five of them. Okay. And now we've got 13 left. <laughs> and they scream all day long. <laughs> okay. So what kind of nest do you have to have for them? Or what kind of anything? They're wild. They don't want a nest. Just trees? Uh, well, we... But do they fly away? To keep them on your property, you need to home them for 10 weeks when they're babies. Mm -hmm. Lock them in their home. Mm -hmm. When they're 10 weeks old, open it and keep it fenced and so they get used to their home. And then they'll range your garden. We just keep our garden locked until plants are up enough so that they won't get knocked over by a kidney walking on them. Right. And then after the bugs start coming out, you open up the garden. Oh you know, my goodness. I'm so we excited. I'm so <laughs> excited. Oh. oh my gosh. That's the best news. This is worth coming tonight. Just to oh that. my <laughs> word. Because those things are disgusting. <laughs> yes. Is, while it's not relevant here, they are also uh, what we're using for picks. 
Oh, guineas? guineas? Nice. Because like we've had a lot of ticks because my daughter's dogs keep getting, I mean, every time they go out, they get ticks. Yes, they oh, that's weird. Any bug. And, and if you have a few bugs you like, like your raised beds with their worms, you do have to chase them out of the raised bed once more. Okay. Okay. Well, that is really good. Oh my gosh. That is great. We can go home now. <laughs> <laughs> I'm telling you. Okay, let's That's go. Cool. Where, where should we go? Um, I, see, we have a lot more information on planning out your garden, but what I would say to you is um, find you, this is really a really great resource. We have put this link in um, our, our notes and things like this. You get a lot of good ideas like this um, and use, go through, glean, find out what works really well for you and use it, um, but don't be afraid to put your own spin on it. Um, you know, it's something you think that's gonna work a little bit better for you, but this is really, this is a good foundation right here. Why don't we go to um, starting seeds? Should yeah. we go there? Let's okay, go. starting seeds. I'm not good at starting seeds, mainly because I don't have a place, really. I, my house is too small, I cannot handle that, but she is good at that. Um, I like to start my own seeds. Um, different reasons is I know what I like, as um, far as um, what type of plants I want to grow. I can't always go and find them and things like that. So um, I will start my own seeds. The other reason I like to start my own is I know what my soil is like. Um, one time I had a really bad experience. I had bought some seeds from a nursery. Come to find out um, it had nematodes in it. And so I've been fighting those nematodes. Not seeds, you got starch. Didn't you get starts? I got there? starts. I'm yes. sorry, did I say you said starts? seeds. Sorry, said seeds. let me starts. start over. I went and bought some plants. The soil was contaminated, it had nematodes in it. Um, I didn't know what they were. And so for a while there, I was fighting what I thought was blight. I thought I had blight in my greenhouse. No, it wasn't, it was the nematodes. You know, when, I, when you go and you pull out the roots and they got, the, it's, it's called knotty root. You got these knots all over these roots. And it's, it's because your soil is infected with nematodes. They get into the roots and then they eventually um, starve the plant. Your plant dies. Your um, fruit goes from being nice big tomatoes to this styrofoam looking stuff. Um, so it's, uh, anyway, so that's, that's the reason why I've always started mine um, from seeds. Uh, so to, to have a really good experience with starting your seeds, um, there's some equipment that you really do need to have. One of it is called a heating mat. You can find heating mats anywhere. And what it does is it gets what it you put your tray. So I like to use trays like this, fill them up with soil. It's got a place where I can put my individual seeds. And um, it's got a tray in here that helps me keep the water, um, keep the water in with it. So it doesn't just, you know, go out and the soil dries up too fast for my seeds. But um, you got your heating mat underneath. You sit this on top of your heating mat. The heating mat keeps the soil at a certain temperature. Most plants germinate right around 65 degrees. And so if you got your seed at a certain temperature, it is going to germinate. And so therefore, um, so anyway, so that helps it germinate quicker. Then also what it does is it helps the seed to grow faster. But you need one more component and that is, is you need uh, a light. You have to have a seed grow light. If you don't, then you start to get the little spindly thin um, seedlings. And those are, those are difficult. And um, well, here, I'll, do you mind if I show? No. Yeah. Okay, so this is kind of, this is what you'll end up with. These are tomato plants right here. Um, you won't find this in the nursery because the nurseries use, um, they use the heat mats and they also use the lights. And the lights will help you to get that robust um, stem. Keeps them shorter. The plants don't have to go looking for the light. It's, it's, uh, you'll just have a lot more success um, in starting your seeds. I know you can, a lot of people like to start them in on their kitchen counter. You can do that and then go put them under a grow light. But if you're going to be starting your own tomatoes, your own peppers, you know anything that's gonna be transplanted um, once the soil gets um, to the right temperature where you can trust it not to have frost, um, you will need to have a light. And uh, so anyway. Um, you, you can be extremely creative with your light. Yeah. We had, from our construction, we mm -hmm. had a few LED lights mm -hmm. left over that were 
uh, full spectrum, mm -hmm. and we just mounted them on boards and it went that way. So, and, and that's all it really is. You know, you, if you sit there and you read about them, that's you've got a few choices, but those LEDs is basically what it is. That's what I have, and uh, it's, it is it's the only way to do it. So, that's how I start my seeds. Um, you do have to have the right equipment. Um, yeah. I do. I have a, I do have do a greenhouse. You do, you do yours in the greenhouse. I have mine in greenhouse and um, I have a, a little station that was made for me where I can put my, I have a three different rows and so I can have my mats and I have a light and then I have another shelf. I have my mats and I have a light and then I have another shelf. And so that's how I do it. And it does. Yeah, it, it does. When you have the light, you don't necessarily need to be by a window. And then so how long is the light supposed to stay on? Um, the light stays on between um, 16 to 18 hours a day is optimal. When you're, so they do need, plants do need to have a rest. So you do need to have that six hours where you do have some darkness. Um, seeds. Tomato seeds, I was gonna oh. say one more thing. Tomato seeds should be started between five and seven weeks before you're gonna put them in the ground. Um, you know, depending on where you're going to be planting them, depends on how big of a hurry you're going to be in. Um, so there's that. But also seeds. Um, um, a good place here in town that is just so funny. It's Kirtland's uh, Fence and Garden. And it, I put the address in there. What is that? It's, I think it's 400 North and something. Anyway, it's a fencing place. But you go in there and they have tons of seeds. And you can buy them by the quarter ounce. You know, so you can get, you don't have to buy, you know, like sometimes we'll go over to Ballard's and you can buy those good seeds, but they're in packages way bigger than you need. And they let you buy like quarter, half ounce, a pound, two pounds, whatever, like pea seeds mm -hmm. or whatever. So that's a really good place. Where else do you get your seeds? Uh, pretty much there. Okay. Pretty, yeah. Pretty yeah. Sure. Any seeds, heirloom seeds. I'm always looking for heirlooms for us. I don't want something that's been genetically modified or hybridized to the point mm -hmm. that you can't save seeds next year. Okay. Yeah. Now, there is pros and cons to that. Mm -hmm. And so I, I do a lot of heirlooms. Um, I, lo I love the flavor of heirloom tomato, but they're, but they're harder to grow. They're harder to grow. They're harder to get to pollinate mm -hmm. and they are harder. Um, they're not as prolific producers. And stuff and so therefore and, and that's the whole reason why they even came up with hybrids is because they wanted to have something that would um, produce would yield more and they also wanted like for tomatoes for instance you know the skins to be a little bit thicker so that they could would last longer on the shelves um, they did have to give up some things for that you know a lot of times your um, hybrids don't have quite the flavor of your heirlooms mm -hmm. but it, it is it's you know it's kind of a balancing hard. thing yeah. they yeah, are hard do it you, is. Do you miss them? I mean, do you grow some hybrids? On I do. She does. I do. And, and our sole purpose was if we have your scenario, Kevin, mm -hmm. and there's no transportation and right. no shipping, I have to have my own seeds yeah. Yeah. for two and three and seven and 10 years. Yeah. Right. So we've got to be able to save our own seeds somehow. Yeah. And, and that's the beauty of heirlooms. Mm -hmm. With you, you can't save seeds from hybrids, but you don't know what you're going to get because. Um, a hybrid, you take this variety and you take this variety, you cross pollinate them and you get your hybrid. Okay. But so if you save the seeds from that hybrid, it's, you're not going to get the same plant the next year. It's going to be different and it might be okay and it might not. And so it's just, you know, it's, it's kind of, I guess, unstable is maybe the word that you would use for that. Yeah. Um, let's see. Oh, and there is a variety of tomato that we have really liked and it's the Phoenix one because it, it just seems to do well here. And so just because that's one of, I mean, we have an underground greenhouse and so we planted our tomatoes first of February, I think. Well, I think they're up this tall now. Wow. So, I mean, those underground ones work really, really good. They, those are fun. Those are fun. But that is the one we like to grow pretty much. Yeah. Everybody has their own favorite. I know. Yeah. 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 And yeah. stuff. I have my own favorite heirloom. I have my own favorite hybrid. Um, and so it, it's kind of fun to talk to people because mm -hmm. I don't grow the Phoenix. I grow yeah. something else. Uh, we, oh, man, they've been good. Yeah. So what are your favorites, Joanne? Um, heirloom, I really love the Brandywine. That's, that's probably my favorite of the heirlooms. Um, hybrid, I like Celebrity. 
and I like um, Early Girl. Okay, um, planting seed tips. Um, I guess the biggest one, uh, your beans and your peas, if you soak them for 24 hours before you plant them, they come up faster. Mm -hmm. um, we just planted, just barely planted our peas on Monday. And so I don't know how quickly they'll come up. But I haven't even looked out there. It's been too cold to walk outside and check the garden. <laughs> Bruce does it every day, but I haven't been out there. Um, tomatoes, talk about the tomato planting. Okay, um, as I was saying, these plants, these still can be used. But when you go and you plant these, as you would with any tomato plant, you can actually plant it deeper than what, where it is coming up out of the ground. Because, so like these guys, they're, they're so um, lanky. <laughs> and, and they're fragile, okay? All of that. Um, so if I was to plant these, I would probably plant it like right here is where my soil would be. It'd be about right, right like there. I just have it sticking out of the ground, maybe um, not quite an inch. And then the cool thing about tomatoes is, is it will start having roots. Everything that's below the surface will, new roots will form. And so it's, uh, so that's just something to know on tomatoes. Even the ones that you get from the store, um, don't be afraid to go ahead and bury it another inch or two, depending on, you know, how big it is, because it will grow new root systems. And the nice thing about that is, is it makes a sturdier plant. You know, you got to, um, the deeper the roots, the, you know, just the sturdier it is. Um, let's see, marking your rows, make sure, oh, keeping a garden diary is, you know, just when did I plant last year? What did I plant? Did it survive? Did it, did I like the, the variety that I planted? Um, so keeping a, a, a garden diary is really good. I have, I've kept one for years and it's really important, especially I'm always trying, I want to try and find the best tomato. You know, that's like my, yeah, that's my thing. The best tomato, the best heirloom. And so, um, and I'll keep track of which ones I do so that I know, oh, never buy that one again. You know, that, that was a fail for sure. Um, or, you know, vice versa. This one's really great. And I'm timing sure. of planting, you know, you can look back and say, oh, I, I planted too early mm -hmm. or whatever, which well, is always our case. X out, try again. Well, yeah, and then, and then, plant. <laughs> plant. oh, I'm not kidding. Bruce gets so excited, but that's why we love him. He's very passionate about life. <laughs> yeah, you know, and in any problems you come up against, you, you know, yeah. I don't know about you guys, but I forget, you know, after you've gardened for so many years, you just kind of forget. I'm really good at the beginning year of the diary garden. <laughs> I'm really bad at the end. I'm like done with gardening. I forget to put down what I've what I think about it. So she's really good at that. But anyway, um, marking your rows. Yeah. Making sure you remember what you planted. Yeah. These are cheap. These are cheap. Um, you can get like 200 for $7 Amazon prime. And, um, you just write on them with a, a Sharpie permanent marker. And, uh, it has saved me a lot of times, especially with my tomatoes. I think, okay, I'm doing this tomatoes here, these tomatoes here, these tomatoes here. And I think I'm going to remember I don't. And so therefore it makes it really hard in my diary. Cause I'm like, Oh, which one was it? <laughs> we do that. Okay. I like this one. I didn't like that where one. Did, where did you get those? Um, Amazon Prime. Yeah, you can get them at Walmart too. I, I have found them at Walmart, but they're just um, they're just little four inch uh, plastic. And um, I was going to say I use popsicle sticks. Um, the thing I do like about these plastics, I'll just give them a little bit of plug. Is the writing stays on mm -hmm. through the entire season. These are last year's. Um, I haven't started my this year ones and the ones that I have are in the ground. And that is, that is a really good plus. Okay. We're going to go on. Should we talk about the garden app? Oh yeah. Well, there, a little there's, bit. yeah, we did put that link in there. Didn't we? I don't know if we put the garden. Link. Anyway, there's some there's awesome garden apps, apps that will um, help you with keeping a diary yeah. from year to year. When um, to plant and it's like companion planting. We haven't talked about that, but yeah. in there they'll talk about, you know, this is, um, good to plant with this and not good to plant with this. So you can kind of plant things that uh, work better together. Yeah. That's another good thing to think about. Um, this year I've started using one called um, Seed to Spoon. And I found that that's a really great little app. Seed to Spoon. It's got a picture of a spoon and it's got these little flowers growing up out of it. Um, really great for um, keeping a journal and also giving you helpful hints as to when to plant, when they fruit, um, companion planting, um, just, you know, all the different things like that. And also helps you to recognize um, pests that that particular plant deals with. 
And so the guineas are going to take care of all the that. guineas. <laughs> <laughs> Yay, guineas. Okay. All right. Yeah, um, any quite anything? Does anyone have any more questions for us? We'll just okay. Or bowls, bowls, who? Bowls and bowls oh, in oh. Your garden. Any we have filters? we have trapped and we have um, put water down the holes, and we have let's see what so I Bruce needs to be here because he's the one that does that. But oh, don't let him get started. If you see him, get rid of him. They're started. They were there when we arrived. We, we moved in on them. And we, four years later, they're still prolific and we're still fighting them with everything. I found if you put gasoline down the whole set of water. But you hate those things. They invade your hard work like deer. I just think they're so rude. <laughs> well, you know, it just goes to show we each we each have our own things that we deal with all throughout the valley. Um, I, I, I hate to even say this. I, I don't. I've never had that problem. Um, I can transplant a few to you. <laughs> as I say, I hate to say this, <laughs> but the rabbit heads, we, we have the rabbits. Um, Wild rabbits. Yeah. Um, Underground. Is that a good reason for having them? They come right across the yard. Yes, yes, the rabbits. If we have to be colored up. Probably when I get into that not, we're completely fenced, so we don't have I that don't, problem. I think they did somewhere else. What we did for rabbits yeah. is we did chicken wire part way up our fence when we lived over at Lone Coyote and kind of dug it down into the ground. Three feet. Three feet into the ground. Yeah. Oh, 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 up high. I don't remember how high it was, but it was probably this high, some high. I don't know. Is there so a we just for the deer? high fences. Six feet. Mm -hmm. Eight foot fence. Mm -hmm. Three six. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> we did that we we i know we've had to deal with deer too it's hard yeah. i know a lady from up north and uh, she got permission to use a paintball gun on, on the yeah and it worked you know what one year and <laughs> they went away. there's one part of our yard where they can get in and one year bruce had a motion detector thing and it would blow up this mickey mouse thing and come up and make this noise it worked, <laughs> uh, but the wind finally eventually got it. Yeah, okay, scared I guess. Away. I guess the other thing it does scare neighbors. <laughs> Cammy Young put on a motion detector on a sprinkler to keep the dogs away from her back from her front yard because they kept going to the bathroom there, and that works too. Wow, it works really good. People to keep are dogs so clever. Away. People are so clever. Okay. I guess the other thing too is, um, you know, for the most part we have really brought problems with deer from, you know, late fall to, you know, early spring, and then they leave. So I would just say to you, um, just watch what you're planting. Um, if, if you're going to do cool crops, you will be dealing with deer. If you're going to be dealing with um, just planting like warm crop gardens, you probably won't have any problems with any of the deer. Just deer don't like tulips, or do like tulips, oh. but won't eat daffodils. So there you go. Yeah. So, you know, it just depends. Okay. What do you think? Tools? Uh, do we have anything else? Yeah, um, tools. tools. Yeah, okay, so we thought we'd just give you our favorite tools. And this is my favorite tool. I always have a white bucket with me because, you know, you, you, you're pulling stuff out, you're throwing it in here, you're hauling dirt, you're doing whatever. So just a plain white bucket. This is funny, but this is one of my other favorite tools that's always in here. <laughs> I'm so funny. When I like to clean up something, like even leaves, it's just so much easier to do that. I even had my kitchen broom out the other day because we were doing the rose bushes and we were, and, but to sweep it all up, my broom just does so much better than anything else. So there you go. That's in there. Um, I always keep these things in here. I always keep my ant poison in here because I just don't like ants. So I kill them. Um, obviously grandkids have been in here. Um, Scissors, I always like scissors and I just get this at IFA, Max Force. Okay. Um, I always wear an apron and this is a homemade apron, <laughs> but I wanted to make it really sturdy, so sturdy material. So I always have my apron. It always has my gloves. It always has my clippers because I'm always clipping my trees or whatever. And this is the fun, another funny thing that I keep is this, because you know those weeds that are in between the slats of something and you can't you know, just dig down and get it. So there you go. 
Um, that's what I have in here. What else do you have? Oh, oh you have an awesome hula. My favorite thing. This is, oh, yes. This I, is my prize right here. I love this. That's a hula hoop. I know everybody's seen a hula hoop, but this one has an aluminum handle. This one is a long handle. Where did you find it? It's there a link. I put there. a link on there. Yes. <laughs> and this one, it's not that much more than the old wooden ones that fall apart at the end of every season or no, before the end of every yes, season. Yes. Yeah. I've had this one for probably four years. It's my second one I've had probably in, in probably eight or 10 years, but I, I love this one. Um, it's not fiberglass. It has plastic over the aluminum. I don't, if I don't have gloves on for some reason, I don't get those little fiberglass things in my hand or, you know, the wood ones, but it's, um, it's made out of a better metal and this keeps its shape much better. It's sharper. Anyway, if you're going to get a hula hoe, which everybody should have a hula hoe, um, you'll die with a hula hoe in your hand. Yeah. That's what I've always I done. love this one, but I've never had an aluminum one and I, now I'm, I'm going to get oh, one. Oh yeah. The handle's aluminum. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. It's, and it's, it's just a, a it's just a plastic that covers the aluminum. Okay. And sorry, you can see there's the tip, but, um, well, well worth it. And, and it's really nice to have the longer handle because you got that much more leverage there. And, and I guess reach too. Um, I also, I love my hand hula ho. Um, when I'm down on my hands and knees, when I am kneeling on my um, little mat right here, this, this saves your knees. Everyone should have one of these. They're only like three or $4. And, um, and it's, it's worth everything. I've had it for a really long time and it's really protected my knees. And, um, but when I'm kneeling down on it, um, I got this little hand hula ho and you can be a little bit more precise, you know, getting in between the plants and not wiping out the wrong plant. So, um, and, and it's very, very effective. You, you can really get a lot of ground really quickly with this. So those are probably my favorite things. And then my other favorite thing course is the, um, the timer, the water timer. Uh, since I found that, Life's been so much easier. Set it 60 minutes, done. <laughs> you know, it's, it's just great. So, you have to set it every time. Well, yeah, when I know when I want to go out and water, I'll just, I mean. So I, it won't water when you're on vacation. No, it won't. You would need to have, you know, a, a whole watering neighbor. system set up for that, you know, the electric you timers battery, and things like that. One that does every day or every other day. There you it's go. About 35 to 40 dollars for that style. Well, there yeah. you go. See, I didn't know about that. So that's awesome. So yes, there's lots of choices, but a water timer is so worth it because you don't want your water bill to go by <sighs> or your neighbors to be mad at you. Yeah. I think we're done. Any questions? Anything? Did we cover everything? We had fun planning this because we just got together and visited and taught each other more, which is what we do. I mean, that's just how you learn is just talking to your friends and neighbors and what they do. So, and then just experience, experience, experience. Every year is a new experience. It is. So, so have you harvested seeds? Who here has harvested seeds? I've, I've kept some. Yeah. And then how do you store them? Envelopes. Paper envelope. Yeah, I just not in a cold place. Um, we put them in a cellar and just drop them in with all the other seeds in a bin. Yeah, spinach is really easy, and radishes they go to seed nicely. Lettuce <laughs> too. Yeah, lettuce. Yeah, I just want lettuce. Yeah, I do. I do a lot of tomatoes. So. And then yeah. we label them because I didn't label and I thought it was radishes, but it was spinach. <laughs> and I had lots of spinach. <laughs> that will happen. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much. Okay. Yeah. Our pleasure. Welcome. Awesome. Thank you. Yay.